A Maoist once said to me, I can easily understand Sartre's purpose in siding with us. I can understand his goals and his involvement in politics. I can partially understand your position, since you've always been concerned with the problem of confinement. But Deleuze is an enigma. I was shocked by this statement, because your position has always seemed particularly clear to me. Possibly we are in the process of experiencing a new relationship between theory and practice. At one time, practice was considered an application of theory, a consequence, at other times, it had an opposite sense, and it was thought to inspire theory, to be indispensable for the creation of future theoretical forms. In any event, their relationship was understood in terms of a process of totalization. For us, however, the question is seen in a different light. The relationships between theory and practice are far more partial and fragmentary on one side, a theory is always local and related to a limited field, and it is applied in another sphere, more or less distant from it. The relationship which holds in the application of a theory is never one of resemblance. Moreover, from the moment a theory moves into its proper domain, it begins to encounter obstacles, walls, and blockages which require its relay by another type of discourse. It is through this other discourse that it eventually passes to a different domain. Practice is a set of relays from one theoretical point to another, and theory is a relay from one practice to another. No theory can develop without eventually encountering a wall, and practice is necessary for piercing this wall. For example, your work began in the theoretical analysis of the context of confinement, specifically with respect to the psychiatric asylum within a capitalist society in the 19th century. Then you became aware of the necessity for confined individuals to speak for themselves, to create a relay, it's possible, on the contrary, that your function was already that of relaying relation to them, and this group is found in prisons, these individuals are imprisoned. It was on this basis, that you organized the information group for prisons, the object being to create conditions that permit the prisoners themselves to speak. It would be absolutely false to say, as the Maoist implied, that in moving to this practice you were applying your theories. This was not an application, nor was it a project for initiating reforms, or an inquiry in the traditional sense. The emphasis was altogether different, a system of relays within a larger sphere, within a multiplicity of parts that are both theoretical and practical. A theorizing intellectual, for us, is no longer a subject, a representing or representative consciousness. Those who act and struggle are no longer represented, either by a group or a union, that appropriates the right to stand as their conscience. Who speaks and acts? It is always a multiplicity, even within the person, who speaks and acts. All of us are grappuscules. Representation no longer exists, there's only action, theoretical action and practical action which serve as relays and form networks. It seems to me, that the political involvement of the intellectual was traditionally the product of two different aspects of his activity, his position as an intellectual in bourgeois society, in the system of capitalist production and within the ideology it produces or imposes, his exploitation, poverty, rejection, persecution, the accusations of subversive activity, immorality, etc., and his proper discourse to the extent that it revealed a particular truth that it disclosed political relationships where they were unsuspected. These two forms of politicization did not exclude each other, but, being of a different order, neither did they coincide. Some were classed as outcasts and others as socialists. During moments of violent reaction on the part of the authorities, these two positions were readily fused after 1848, after the Commune, after 1940. The intellectual was rejected and persecuted at the precise moment when the facts became incontrovertible when it was forbidden to say that the emperor had no clothes. The intellectual spoke the truth to those who had yet to see it, in the name of those who were forbidden to speak the truth, he was conscience, consciousness, and eloquence. In the most recent upheaval, the intellectual discovered that the masses no longer need him to gain knowledge, they know perfectly well, without illusion, they know far better than he and they are certainly capable of expressing themselves. But there exists a system of power which blocks, 
prohibits and invalidates this discourse and this knowledge, a power not only found in the manifest authority of censorship, but one that profoundly and subtly penetrates an entire societal network. Intellectuals are themselves agents of this system of power. The idea of their responsibility for consciousness and discourse forms part of the system. The intellectual's role is no longer to place himself somewhat ahead and to the side in order to express the stifled truth of the collectivity, rather, it is to struggle against the forms of power that transform him into its object and instrument in the sphere of knowledge, truth, consciousness, and discourse. In this sense, theory does not express, translate, or serve to apply practice, it is practice. But it is local and regional, as you said, and not totalizing. This is a struggle against power, a struggle aimed at revealing and undermining power, where it is most invisible and insidious. It is not to awaken consciousness that we struggle, the masses have been aware for some time, that consciousness is a form of knowledge, and consciousness as the basis of subjectivity is a prerogative of the bourgeoisie, but to sap power, to take power, it is an activity conducted alongside those who struggle for power, and not their illumination from a safe distance. A theory is the regional system of this struggle. Precisely. A theory is exactly like a box of tools. It has nothing to do with the signifier. It must be useful. It must function. And not for itself. If no one uses it, beginning with the theoretician himself, who then ceases to be a theoretician, then the theory is worthless or the moment is inappropriate. We don't revise a theory, but construct new ones, we have no choice, but to make others. It is strange, that it was Proust, an author thought to be a pure intellectual, who said it so clearly, treat my book as a pair of glasses directed to the outside, if they don't suit you, find another pair, I leave it to you to find your own instrument, which is necessarily an investment for combat. A theory does not totalize, it is an instrument for multiplication and it also multiplies itself. It is in the nature of power to totalize, and it is your position, and one I fully agree with, that theory is by nature opposed to power. As soon as a theory is enmeshed in a particular point, we realize that it will never possess the slightest practical importance, unless it can erupt in a totally different area. This is why the notion of reform, is so stupid and hypocritical. Either reforms are designed by people who claim to be representative, who make a profession of speaking for others, and they lead to a division of power, to a distribution of this new power, which is consequently increased by a double repression, or they arise from the complaints and demands of those concerned. This latter instance is no longer a reform, but revolutionary action that questions, expressing the full force of its partiality, the totality of power and the hierarchy that maintains it. This is surely evident in prisons, the smallest and most insignificant of the prisoners' demands, can puncture Plevin's pseudo-form. If the protests of children, were heard in kindergarten, if their questions were attended to, it would be enough to explode the entire educational system. There is no denying, that our social system is totally without tolerance, this accounts for its extreme fragility in all its aspects, and also its need for a global form of repression. In my opinion, you were the first in your books, and in the practical sphere to teach us something absolutely fundamental, the indignity of speaking for others. We ridiculed representation, and said it was finished, but we failed to draw the consequences of this theoretical conversion to appreciate the theoretical fact, that only those directly concerned, can speak in a practical way on their own behalf, 